All right, thank you everyone for joining us today for our Lunch and Learn on Family Conflict. Uh, my name is Bridget Downey. I am from the Mental Health Association of Fauquier County, and we um, do adv advocacy and outreach um, on mental wellness in Fauquier and Rappahannock counties. We are pleased to be partnering with uh, Lori Parker and Piedmont Dispute Resolution Center today um, for a presentation on family conflict. Um, we know that after the holidays, we've been a lot, uh, might be with our families quite a bit and it can uh, lead to some tensions. So we wanted to learn new ways of coping with the family difficulties and family challenges. So thank you so much, Lori, for joining us today. I also wanna introduce our facilitator and board member, Ms. Darlene Kelly, and she is going to be um, facilitating the conversation and we're, we welcome all of you and um, thank you and enjoy the session. Now I'll turn it over to Darlene now. Thank you, Bridget. Good morning to everyone. We're excited to be here with you today uh, for our second uh, Lunch and Learn and um, I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for today, Mrs. Lori Parker. She has been a resident of Fauquier County for 41 years and is married to um, the retired Judge Jeff Parker. And um, they have children together and are very prominent people in our community. Mrs. Lori Parker has been actively involved in mediation and restoration justice at the national, state, and community level for 34 years. She's the founder of the Piedmont Dispute Resolution Center, which is also known as PDRC in Warrington, and has been its executive director since 1990. Her state court mediation certifications include general district court, juvenile, domestic relations, district court, circuit court, civil, circuit court, family mediator, and basic mediator trainer. During her tenure at PDRC, she has developed numerous services and training programs, including restorative justice, community conversations, and mental health and elder mediation. She is the current president of the Resolution Virginia, the Coalition of Virginia's Nonprofit Community Mediation Centers, and is a past pre president of the Virginia Mediation Network. In 2011, Lori received the Virginia Mediation Network's Distinguished Mediator Award. In 2010, she was named by the Virginia Law Lawyers Media, publisher of Virginia Lawyers Weekly and the Virginia Medical Law Report to the class of 2010 of the influential women of Virginia. In 2001, she received an award from the Supreme Court of Virginia's Office of the Executive Secretary for Outstanding Achievement in Community Medicaid, Medi Medi Mediation. She received a BA from the University Achievement in Community Med Mediation. She received uh, a, BA, a BA from the University of M Michigan and an MBA in the University of Mary Washington. Those credentials are very um, are very outstanding. And I would like to say from my own point of view, I know her personally and professionally and what she has brought to this community goes without saying. So we welcome you today, Lori. We ask everyone that is participating to please um, become a, an active part of this Lunch and Learn. You may um, drop any of the questions that you may have into the chat box. We're excited because as we all know, all of us throughout our lifetime have had disputes of some sort or another uh, and have had to learn how to navigate around them. And if we need to have opportunities to learn more ways to navigate through dispute resolution, you're at the right place today. Thank you all for attending. So Bridget, do we turn it over to Lori at this time? Yes, thank you, Darlene. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Darlene. I feel like I should have stopped while I was ahead when you when you mentioned all the different things, but, um, but I'm really honored to be here today to share what um, we mediators have learned along the way in uh, serving our community through mediation and restorative justice. And um, I think that 
today, these types of uh, presentations, I don't know if you all remember the commercial, the V8 commercial where they're drinking a soda and they go, oh, I should have had a V8. It's like, it's, it's kind of a V8 um, hour. It's, oh, I, I knew that. Oh, I should have done that. Um, so you may have some V8 experiences. And, um, and, and uh, Bridget asked me to do a presentation on uh, conflict styles and kind of basics of mediation. And, and that's a good place to start because even when we train mediators to work in the court system, the first thing we do is ask them to look inward themselves and how they deal with conflict because we believe where you can reach out to someone, you really need to know yourself. And I would say that in our personal lives too, particularly with me, with um, conflict. Um, so if you can give us the next slide. I think the next slide will be the leading objective of the mental health implications of conflict management, conflict resolution, and certainly um, conflict uh, can really negatively or positively impact our mental well-being, our mental health well-being, depending on how we approach it, um, the skills we uh, use to navigate, as Darlene said, and, um, and our attitudes actually towards conflict also. So we're gonna be looking at our conflict styles, conflict management, strategies for conflict resolution, and then I'll talk a little bit about the basics of mediation. Next slide, please. So, um, and I didn't know whether, Bridget, did you wanna mention these about these slides? I can, I can talk a little bit about those, Lori. Thank you. Um, as our presenter has talked today, uh, has already introduced that we're gonna be discussing family conflict and mental health. You'll see on this slide that it says family conflict in early childhood to adolescents are linked to insecure attachments and anxiety, internalizing, and um, all different types of patterns and adolescent depress depression. Um, imbalance between demands of family life, work life, they lead to psychological stress. Family discord or associated with child neglect and brain differences, and children of conflict families continue this cycle of dysfunction into their own lives and families. And I'd like to add just a little bit to that, that it's very clear that as children are growing up in households that have a lot of negative energy going on and things that are not resolved and a lot of conflict day in and day out, it not only brings anxiety into the uh, entire family, and the child, but it can lead to other mental health issues such as depression. It can also lead to uh, someone isolating themselves, someone uh, thinking that their self-worth is nothing because they haven't heard anything that helps them get through a conflict. Conflict is real. We all have to learn how to deal with things that are uncomfortable, but when it's not presented in a certain way, it leads to a lot of mental health issues that can labor on from early childhood to your present day. And we always focus in on the number one thing about being depressed. Well, depression leads to a lot of other things as well. That is a medical diagnosis, but uh, when we think about anxiety and depression, we can end up with other disease processes, um, heart attacks, diabetes, uh, hypertension, but we can um, find someone that's dealing with always having conflict unresolved, that they can't even get through day-to-day -day activities because they feel so overwhelmed. So we're looking forward to hearing how to deal with conflict so that we can rise above some of the darkness that does appear in individuals' lives when all they have known is conflict and not knowing how to get beyond it, how to express themselves in a healthy way how to communicate with someone else in a special way, and how to reach out for resources when it's more than an individual can um, overcome. Lori, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and really, actually, conflict mediation itself is um, predicated on two premises and only two, 
And it, the first is that, as Darlene said, conflict is normal. It is part of everyday life. Every day, good parents, good kids, good siblings don't see things the same way. Um, if Darlene and I don't see things the same way, she, I, I might think there's something wrong with her. She may think there's something wrong with me. She may actually think there's something wrong with me. <laughs> But um, the reality is we're two different people. We have different experiences, we have different personalities, and all of those um, impact how we approach uh, conflict. The second uh, premise is that while conflict is normal, it does not have to be destructive. It does not have to destroy us emotionally, mentally, um, uh, financially. We see that a lot in mediation for people who have uh, gone to court and spent thousands and thousands of dollars on a court case. Um, and on litigation, um, and certainly it does not have to destroy us physically. So when throughout this um, next 45 minutes that we have together, 50 minutes, um, I want you to, if when you hear something um, and you may feel uneasy about it, I want to remind you that getting out of our comfort zone is really where the magic happens. And, and you may um, be a service provider who have families who, are dealing with a lot of conflict and um, encourage them to just try and get out of their comfort zone um, when it comes to dealing with conflict. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. All right. Okay. So, um, so let me just start out with this and and uh, jump in um, if you can. Uh, when you hear the word conflict what word or word pictures come to mind? For example, conflict is like, or my family does conflict. When you hear the word conflict, um, what's the first word or word picture that comes to your mind? Anyone? Bondage. Pardon me? Bondage. Bondage. And you may want to put it in the chat if you want. Do we have someone argument argument in the chat? Yelling, fight. So we'll um, and we could go on, but um, oftentimes our first thoughts when it comes to conflict are and, and what do all these words really have in common? They're all negative. And, um, and it is just human nature that when we think of conflict, we think of something negative. So we believe at PDRC and mediators that conflict does not have to end up in fighting and arguing and bondage. It can actually, well, what, what positive things can come from conflict? Um, when, Lori, I see where someone added misunderstanding, but um, on that side of it, we could certainly get to the other side of understanding one another. Yes. So something positive that can come out of conflict is understanding. And perhaps even growing of a relationship. Uh, and, um, but oftentimes, in fact, I, the first time I ever did this exercise was at Grace Miller Elementary School in the nine, during the Persian Gulf War. And the, and the little elementary kids, when we asked them that, they said things like guns, soldiers. Mm. And, and it still breaks my heart today that, that those were the views. Um, but, and it doesn't take us long to think about those negative words. I think one of the best descriptions I ever heard of conflict um, in word picture was nails scratching on a blackboard. Uh, and it doesn't take us long to think of those words. It takes us a little longer to um, think of the positive. And, uh, and keep that in mind when you're, uh, the next time you're in a conflict, um, and as sure as I'm sitting here and gonna walk out the door in about an hour, um, conflict will happen. So next slide. Okay, um, the, one of the first things we ask people to think about is how do you deal with conflict? What is your conflict management style? And I think Bridget's gonna give you this um, link. There, US, United States Institute of Peace. I don't know if you knew there was one, but there is. In fact, it's right um, when you come off I-66 and you will actually see that the building is designed like a dove. 
Um, but they have an excellent uh, assessment that you can take. I encourage you to do that. I just did it the other day. It's based on what is called the Thomas Kilman conflict mode. Um, and we're not going to do that now, but um, but it really is important for you to be aware. And, and if you can give us the next slide, state, um, Bridget. Uh, that um, if you're aware of your conflict style uh, and aware of that other person's conflict style, it will help you to hopefully be able to adjust your style based on the other person and what that conflict is about. And um, I wanted to offer this uh, graph, if you will, on styles of conflict management. There were two professors from Harvard many years ago who came up with this, and, they, and it's based on um, how we all deal with conflict or negotiation. There are usually two things going on in a conflict, um, and that is the relationship with the other person. And then um, if you look at that vertical um, axis, our goals and our needs. What's unique about family conflict is the relationship. The relationship is often, oftentimes deep-seated, long-standing, and it is ongoing. Um, compared to, uh, for example, what is today? Yesterday, we were in general district court here in Fauquier County and um, working with uh, landlord tenant and consumer merchant cases, cases where the, the parties probably won't have a long-term, did not have a long-term relationship and won't. But in family cases, we will, we will. And um, oftentimes family conflict can cause deeper wounds um, than any other type of conflict that you may have with another person. Um, but it also offers deeper um, relationships and greater satisfaction if you can maneuver out of them. So um, so what this graph is showing is um, a person who avoids conflict, if you you know talk to the hand or no, we're not having a problem, everything's fine, um, is the turtle. The person who avoids it, you can see that the relationship is probably not going to grow. It might even go south, and they're not going to get their goals met because they're not willing or able to talk about it. Uh, the accommodator, one of the other end, here cares most about the relationship at the expense of getting their needs and their goals met. The the shark, the competing, the competing one, um, is more interested in getting his or her goals or needs met not really interested um, for whatever reason about the relationship itself with that other person. And then, um, and then the fox is kind of win some lose. Okay, my husband and I go through this almost every night about controlling the, who controls the, uh, the TV, uh, the TV. And uh, last night <laughs> we watched basketball, but tonight we're not. <laughs> we're going to watch that tonight. Um, and then the collaborator is a person who pays just as much attention to the relationship uh, in, when they're navigating up through that conflict as they do getting the goals met. So a, a collaborator will say, um, I'd like to hear what's important to you, and, and I'd like to tell you, talk to you about what's important to me, and, and find a way this, that both are needs to meet. Okay, next slide. Uh, here, here's the what we call the orientation. So it is just exactly what I said. The, when we say win-win, and actually you've probably heard of the term win-win. Um, and a lot of people think that it means, oh, we both win. And, and to a degree, and oftentimes that's right. But what we really think about in mediation is their, their goals and needs are met. And that's a win. And the relationship uh, stays in touch. And that's a win. Okay, next slide. So um, the sources of conflict, and, and um, like I said, every day conflict occurs, every day good family. A myth that circulating, I think, um, is that, uh, that if we're in conflict, and I'm not a good parent, or my child is not a good child, or my, my sister or, or brother or husband or whoever, <clears throat> there's something terribly wrong with us. And that's just not true. It is a natural phenomenon. 
Uh, and um, sometimes those conflicts are can be internal to the family, personality, uh, and sometimes it can be external. Oftentimes, like finances, will cause a lot of conflict in the family. Um, and it's really, or something going on with an individual family, perhaps they're in crises. Um, it really could be many, many things um, that causes conflict, causes stress, and right behind stress comes conflict. Slide. So I wanted to offer you some conflict resolution mistakes to avoid. I'm gonna read them over and I might talk a little bit about them, but I want you to think about them. Um, a mistake to avoid is avoiding the conflict altogether. Conflicts are a lot like cavities. You know, they don't get, don't get better on their own. Uh, they oftentimes get bigger. Um, being defensive, and that's a natural human reaction when somebody's coming at you. Accusations, frustration, and perhaps even yelling um, is to be defensive. Try very hard. It takes, in, from, for me, it takes total mental and physical control to uh, stay focused and not, and, and not, I found that defensiveness because no, with defensiveness is no one's listening to each other. We're just trying to think of what we're going to say next. Um, over generalizing, you always do, so you never do that. Um, being right, um, uh, and you may you may end up convincing that other person that you're right, but the relationship again that, uh, may be damaged. Um, psychoanalyzing or mind reading what that person, what's going on with that person that you know they're thinking that way or feeling that way, because oftentimes that will lead to well, then I know what the solution is. And really the solution is uh, between the two of you or among the family members, um, forgetting to listen. A lot, a lot of what we do uh, in mediation is listen. Um, and um, playing the blame game, well, it's your fault because that immediately puts the other person on the defensive, trying to win the argument, um, making character attacks. And then stonewalling are three things, are, are 10 things to, to avoid. And when you look at it, we've all done a combination of probably every one of those at some point or another. Um, my favorite is stonewalling. I give it silent at home, <laughs> at least the silent treatment. You're gonna have to suffer because I'm mad. Um, okay, next slide. So, um, I want you to think of a conflict that you recently experienced or observed. Um, what were its characteristics? At its core, what was that conflict about? And, and I'm gonna ask all of you who are listening um, and tuned in to, uh, to think about that and, um, and respond to that. Think of a conflict that you recently experienced or observed, it doesn't have to be one of your own personal ones, um, could be even something you saw on TV. At its core, what was that conflict about? And you can put it in the chat or you can um, um, shout it out. <laughs> Well, let's go on to the next slide and I'll give you some ideas. Um, Lori, excuse sure. me, it's Darlene. Um, I do have something to add to that, but do you mind uh, raising the volume of your voice a little bit when you're speaking, please? Um, um, if you could just speak a little bit louder. Yeah, I'll try to, I'll try to speak closer because I'm not sure this is not my computer and I don't know how to do that. Okay. Um, okay. When you asked that question a while ago, um, some input has been stonewalling. Um, blaming the other person, um, and then just feeling stuck when those things occur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Let's go to the next slide. And I want to go through a list of common conflict characteristics. Oftentimes, not always, um, but oftentimes it may be the cause of it, the underlying reason that brought 
brought forth this conflict is incomplete information. Uh, one person didn't hear the whole story. It was often the case when my children were younger and came home and after they had gotten in trouble in school, well, it's the teacher, she did. And, you know, and I find out that I'm not getting the whole story um, or inaccurate information. At least one of us doesn't, we don't have all the information or we're confused or we're overloaded or we're stressed. And don't underestimate stress as a cause of conflict. Uh, different viewpoints, we see things differently, we have different beliefs, we have different values. And actually when our values are threatened um, is, can cause a great deal of conflict. And we all have different values. Um, limited resources, we can't, um, there's only so much to go around. In juvenile court, when we're working with families who um, the parents are splitting up and won't be together for the rest of their lives, um, but they'll always be parents. And we're looking at custody, visitation, and child support. Um, the, most, the, the most common causes of conflict are uh, limited resources because there's only so much time and there's only so much money. And then unmet psychological needs. Um, and I would never underestimate that. You might wanna even think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs because we all have a need uh, for identity, for security, um, for recognition, to feel and be in control of our lives um, or if our fairness is threatened. You, you hear even little, three-year-old saying, that's not fair. They're already understanding that, or at least experiencing conflict and the reasons for the conflict. Um, got Bridget here, who's I think gonna try to work with the, with, sorry, with the um, sound. Oops. Lori, while, while uh, Bridget is trying to work with that um, volume issue there, there's been a comment or two about how in conflicts at times, it, it could trigger an experience that you've had in a negative way that could bring more stress and um, mm -hmm. make the conflict resolution even harder. Do you have some input as to how you could um, share with us that yes, when- Yes, uh, absolutely, darling. Um, and we don't have, uh, time for the short period of time that we're together today, but there are certainly breathing techniques that you can do to help calm down, to help you find your center again so that you can deal with the conflict. Um, and um, and I, I, that's what I would say is look at breathing techniques and, um, and try to find something that the two of you can agree on but, um, but certainly flashbacks can of uh, previous conflicts that did not go well um, can, and, and, and that is not uncommon in family arguments. Um, and I've seen it in um, elder issues where two siblings are trying to uh, work with their parent or parents. Um, uh, living arrangements, for example. And one feels strongly that the parent may need to, the elder parent may need to be in um, assisted living. Or the other feels strongly that, no, mom can live on her own. She just needs extra help. Um, but, and on its face, you can say, well, the common characteristics, you know, they, we need more information. We need all the information. We have different viewpoints. But, there, but also behind that are, is the relationship. Well, you just feel that way, or they're thinking you just feel that way because um, you were always a kid and you want to be in the kid. And so it can bring up, particularly in family situations, past negative experiences and conflict. And hopefully that helps. Um, I don't, can you all hear me okay now, or do I need to put on uh, headphones? Just because of your eye. That has a different mic. Okay, can you all hear me okay, Darlene? It's a little bit better. Okay, so um, Debbie is gonna help me put on 
Excuse me, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll take a minute while they're helping um, with this situation. If there's anything else that you'd like uh, to be addressed or add to the chat um, area so that if we are unable to get to it today that in the future we would be able to address some other issues. We appreciate your uh, interaction here. Lori? So I've got a different microphone on, is that better? Yes. Okay, okay. Okay, so let's go on to, does anybody have any comments on that? Many of you on the line are uh, work in the service, serve others in our professionals. If, if you wanted to add to any of that, or do you see, have you seen um, conflicts that at their core, if you peel back all the layers, um, what you find, oftentimes, especially in family conflicts, if if one one of you can can identify, it sounds like you know incomplete information has caused this conflict. It will change the dynamic almost immediately. Um, uh, you mentioned Darlene about, or somebody mentioned about past conflict. Um, if that past conflict had to deal with uh, anger, there are ways to try to calm an angry person down. There are ways to, to deal with your own anger, um, and, um, and, but there are ways also to calm an angry person down. Again, it takes total mental and physical control. It's one of those, um, it's so simple, but it's not easy. It's easy to put it on the slides. Um, and it's easy to talk about it, but it's hard to walk out the door and actually do it. And it does take a desire and a want to do it. Lori, we have a question. What is the best way for a family member to deal with another family member that doesn't understand what the conflict is really about? Misunderstandings of the core issue. Okay. So what, so dig down a little deeper. What, what is the misunderstanding? What is the misunderstanding about? Is, is it about values? Is it about you know, different viewpoints? Is it about different beliefs? You know, where we see this actually, in, in, uh, Bridget talked about, or um, Darlene talked about family coming out of holidays who may, may have been in conflict with family members, could be politics. Um, so I would have to ask what, I mean, I, I've heard certainly many family members say in mediation to the other person, you just don't understand. It, to me, what I'm hearing is there's an unmet need that is not being addressed, that is still under the table. We need to get that on the table. In fact, if you can get to the next slide, um, Bridget. Uh, I wanted to introduce what we call the pin pyramid. Uh, and you can see oftentimes the top is positions, what we state what our solution is, what we must have. We pounding our fist on the table and we'd say, this is the way it's going to be. Oftentimes that person is a shark. Um, and, um, but below that position is an interest. Is there other interests? Why do they want it? Um, why, are they, why are they saying it? What, what, is, um, uh, what is their interest below that position? And then even below that, what are the needs, what we must have? Um, and let me give you an example. A lot of my examples are um, in, from juvenile court where um, the, the mother may come in and say, um, I, I need more. And actually we're seeing this more with un unemployment going higher, um, motions to amend child support. And the mother may come in and say, I need more, I need more money. Um, and I, I absolutely need more money. And that's her position. But what might be her interest? Why would she need more money? Oftentimes it's to pay the bills. It's the rent. It's food on the table. But so what is the the need underneath that interest? What is her need? Oftentimes, again, you might want to think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and maybe um, security. You know, a roof over our heads. 
maybe the need of identity, being a, a good mother, providing mother. So if you can get, and even with that, what if there's a misunderstanding, what's the unmet need of that person, of both persons? Um, what are their underlying interests? The best mediators I've seen over the decades now are the ones who can get beyond the positions to the interests and the needs, because oftentimes you will find common ground. Um, let me put it in another perspective. Um, um, so we have four children, one is in heaven now, um, and he was, a, he was a special ed child. Uh, and, you know, when I, in fact, I got involved in mediation because of a conflict, actually with Fauquier County Public Schools over um, Ben's education. And um, if I had come into a IEP meeting, you know, slamming my fist on the table saying Ben needs 10 hours of speech and language therapy, and I am not going to leave here until he gets it. But what's the underlying interest? What, what is the why being underneath that? And then what are my perceived needs, my child's perceived needs? When we got below that to the interests and the needs, they're almost identical to the school systems. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Look, look beyond the positions. Laurie, excuse me. There are a couple um, statements that have been made as we're looking at the Penn Pyramid um, that both parties have the same needs for both when it comes to the cost of living. And that mm -hmm. uh, could certainly have an impact on mm -hmm. the mediation process there. Mm -hmm. The next statement was a difficult source of conflict within families is one person's felt need to be in control of another person versus the basic human needs as you were talking of the hierarchy, hierarchy for sovereignty over self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what I would, actually, that's when I think a mediator would come in very, very, um, would be able to help them navigate through that. Um, if the one person who is being dominated has a conflict style and it may be their personality, maybe their experience, how they grew up, it may be um, what has just worked, you know, put up and shut up. And um, a mediator can help balance that. What mediators, one of their primary purposes is to balance the power in the room. Um, that's not always easy for that person who has been on the receiving end of being dominated and controlled. Uh, and then, uh, so that's what I would suggest. But um, but that the person who, are you, I don't know if you're asking about the person who is being dominated and controlled or the person who has a need to be dominated and controlled. Actually, that, that to dominate and control. There, you really want to look at that underlying need. Being in control of one's life is certainly a basic need. Um, but being in control of other people is a fallout for that need. It's not the, it's not the need itself, it's a fallout from it. And a, um, a um, Difference could be in values, but a difference in uh, what what has worked in the past. If that's worked for you in the past, by all means, that's what you're going to use. Um, but the what is it due to the relationship? So I'm not sure if I'm answering that. Specifically. Um, you have addressed um, the over all questions and statements there, but I do know as we move further along in this um, session you're gonna talk about the different ways that individuals can learn to mediate. Mm -hmm. um, there's one other question before we move on. I know we're talking about family conflicts here, but uh, the question is, um, does the relationship between family members versus between friends versus between employees and boss versus patient and doctor impact what the expected results of a conflict conflict resolution should be. Okay. I think it, go back to that, the first thing we talked about are the different styles of management. You, you need, if you're in a conflict with uh, a coworker, you need to decide what relationship you want to have. 
um, what relationship works for you, what relationship is life giving for you. And, um, and if it is, if you want harmony in the workplace, if you want to go into the workplace and feel good about what you're doing, then probably a, a strong relationship or, for relationship or at least a relationship that is not negative is something that you're going to want. Um, if you want, if when you're in a family, if you have a, if you are, um, if you have a, a sibling um, who is very domineering and controlling, and that is hurting you, impacting you psychologically, mentally, emotionally, um, you may need to decide what style of conflict, how do I need to approach this person? How do I need to approach my brother and my sister? Um, and what will be the ramifications? So, so for example, the, and I don't know if this is helpful or what you, whether it's addressing the question, but um, let's say uh, that question about what, you know, ma, ma, we're going to put mom in an assisted living, end of our end, end of discussion. I've decided that, and that's what we're going to do. Um, if that person is unwilling or unable. Sometimes you know the difference between um, uh, willingness and ability. Some people are very able to navigate through conflict, but they're unwilling to. Some people are willing, but they're unable. Um, then sometimes you have to make those hard decisions. Is this relationship one that um, if I continue to acquiesce, it's going to hurt me? It's going to damage me emotionally. And do I need to back away from it? But consider the consequences before you do. And I would encourage you to try to use some conflict resolution uh, skills and steps before you make that decision. Because in the long run, um, e even that special ed example that I use, um, I, I don't know these people. I didn't know them very well. At least I'm not related to them, the, the special ed teachers or administrators. But I also know that um, in my case, I had a child who was nonverbal. He couldn't tell me what was happening in the school system or the school school day and what he was learning. Um, and I also had three other children coming through the public schools. So you know, did I want to, do I want to walk away from that and, and, and uh, be demanding? Well, I could, but what's going to happen to the long-term relationship? And that's what I would, and that's the biggest thing I think with uh, families is, You've got, you've got a history, um, you've got patterns of how you maneuver through conflict in the past, um, and you've got a future together. And um, if you make that, you know, some people do make that major decision that, um, that I, I just can't, um, I'm jeopardizing my own well-being by being in a relationship with my siblings. But that's pretty dramatic. I would um, try other strategies first. And here are some of the strategies you can use or help that other person use. Um, and one is separate the people from the problem. So we say in mediation, be soft on the people and tough on the problem. Define the problem, not in terms of the person. Well, you know, uh, the whole problem is, is our brother Johnny, he's just wants his way all, all the time. Define it in terms of um, not Johnny or John, whoever, but um, but the problem itself, the issue, the issue. So so when we can separate the people from the problem, it is easier to, particularly with a very dominant person, to if to disarm that person. Uh, focus on interests, not positions. We already talked about that. Oftentimes, positions are incompatible, but the interests below them, particularly in families, are often where that common ground is found. And when you've got a common ground, then you have a basis, a platform on which you can, the scaffolding you need to, um, even if you disagree, you understand each other better. Even if somebody has to make the decision, you understand it better and you've had an opportunity to express yourself and you had an opportunity to listen to the other person. Gen generate options for mutual gain. How can we both, how can we both get our needs met? Um, and assure a fair process. The process is just as important as the outcome. 
And oftentimes that process in a family situation is the very simply, we both have an opportunity to talk. And so listen. in fact, if there's any magic at all in mediation, I would say that everyone has an opportunity to talk and everyone has an opportunity to listen. That deep listening is so important. And that's where I think we professionals can be the best models for our clients. If we are, if we are deep listening to them, um, oftentimes they can follow suit and not even be aware of it. And then practice direct communication. Don't talk about the person, talk to the person and with the person. So if you've got a conflict, you really do need, and you want to resolve it, um, particularly in families, you need to carve out the time to do it. You absolutely need the opportunity to, if, if you do it on the fly and as they're walking out the door or uh, certainly in a state of, um, of um, frustration and anger, and there are different ways to deal with people who are angry, um, one of the quick, quickest ways I can tell you is when somebody's coming at you very angry, first of all, you need to again, be in total physical and emotional and mental control of your own emotions. If you can talk lower and slower, that angry person will be getting, it's physiological, will begin to calm down. Um, lower decibels are easier to hear. And if you can talk at a rate slower than heart rate, that person will actually begin to calm down. Uh, so communication is absolutely critical. Can you put the next slide? Um, and communication is simply listening so that others can speak and speak so that others can listen. And I can think of many times in my motherhood where um, I failed at that. And I'm, I know I still do today in a variety of settings, but um, I can remember my kids coming home from school and telling me about their day, and I was busy. Not, you know, I didn't, not, I certainly cared about their day. I was busy making the dinner. I was busy reading something. Um, so listening so that others can truly speak. Oftentimes, what I offer to people is to paraphrase, to restate what you heard them say. Um, include a fact and a feeling. So you felt frustrated because Mrs. Jones wouldn't let you turn your paper in late. Um, that really helps the, the person who is speaking. It kind of puts a mirror to what they're saying. Um, and oftentimes you get more information too. Well, yeah, she, she did remind us uh, two days ago and yesterday and, and, you, and you get more information. Um, and then the next slide. So, and speaking so that others can listen. And I'm sure you've all seen this iMessage. It's really hard for us to hear the you messages. Well, you've done it, and, and, but it's very easy to get sucked into it, even as, as speakers. Um, uh, no way, you've done it again. You know, your room isn't clean. You haven't done your homework. You haven't done any chores, but you, you, you. And before you know it, that person is beginning to clam up. Um, but if you do an iMessage, I feel your feeling. You have to be, you're, you're accountable. If you want that other person accountable for their actions and their words, um, you need to be accountable for your own. You need to be willing to be accountable for your own. So, um, and then state the, the issue, the situation. And this is the hard, you know, hard part for me anyway, in non judgmental terms. And then the because, the consequence to you. Um, and then I would like it with, or I. I think, or I expect, or I want. Um, my old, I always give examples of my own family. I, I sometimes I wonder what my kids think. They're all, they're having children of their own now. So, but um, I can remember my oldest son, Tommy, uh, and I had totally different personalities and different perspectives on conflict and pretty much anything else. He had that um, choleric personality, that sudden burst of anger, and then he was older. Whereas I'm very, I'm more phlegmatic. It's very slow for me. Um, I'm, I do kind of that slow burn. It's slow for me. I, I get angry and frustrated slowly, but then it takes me a while to get over it. And um, and I can remember uh, talking to him about something. And he said, what are you talking about? That was two days ago. That was three days ago. Well, 
it, it, I finally, I was finally able to process it. But um, Tommy would come home late when he was a teenager from being out with his friends or whatever. And, you know, I'd be waiting, seating at the door. And, you know, well, you've done it again. You're late again. You never bothered to call. Of course, this was before cell phones were prominent. Um, to the point that he would just, you know, talk to the hand and just walk to his room. Um, and then one day I learned about the eye messages. And he came home and... Um, and I said, you know, I feel so scared um, when, um, when you're late when, and I don't hear from you because I love you and I worry about you. And that really opened up for Tommy and I, I'm sorry, I, get, I always give these liquid testimonies, but it, it really opened up for Tommy and I um, a dialogue where we could really hear and understand each other and come to an agreement on what was gonna happen the next time. Um, if he was going to be late. Uh, okay, next slide, if you will. Uh, so I wanted to give you an eight-step process uh, you could use yourself or offer to uh, those you serve. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first is um, deal effectively again with that anger. An angry person we know that ourselves. When we're angry, we can't think straight. We can't think clearly. We can't think logically. Um, a lot, we can't get into it now, but the, a lot of physiological, emotional things are going on that prevent us from doing that. Um, so deal effectively with your anger and, that, and deal the best you can with that. Help that other person deal with theirs. Define the problem or issue. First thing we're going to, so it's very logical. And this is what we do as mediators, actually. We're first going to define the problem. We can't work through it unless we're in agreement with what the problem is. We're going to peel back the layers and really identify at its core, what is this about? Um, or it may be the problem or the decision that has to be made. Um, define how each of you may contribute to that problem. List things that you have done which have not been successful. So this hasn't worked and this hasn't worked. Um, think about number five, um, list, po list possible solutions. You know, and, and underneath all of this, um, girded by all of this is that deep listening and um, communicating. Discuss the solutions, agree on a solution and how each person will work toward the solution. That's why it's so important to be soft on the person and tough on the problem, define the problem in terms of the issue, not the person. Because oftentimes if we, if we as mediators would jump immediately for, to step seven, you know, well, what can you agree on? Well, um, I can agree that he needs to move out or he needs to listen to me or he needs to just back off. Well, we can always find ways for that other person to do something to make things better, but we really need to look at ourselves. What can we do? Um, because in all likelihood, we contribute to the argument, the conflict too. So what can we do? And then the last, I would say, particularly in the family situations, the follow-up. How's it going? We see each other every day oftentimes in a home environment or we talk to each other every week, um, we need to cycle back and find out how that's working, how that solution we decided on is working. Okay, I don't- Lori, there yes. is a question. What type of follow-up do you suggest that would work best? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to assume that you have both decided to sit down in a calm environment and work through um, that conflict, I would suggest um, being as specific. And in fact, the agreements um, should be particularly if it's about like a living arrangement or whatever. The greater the specificity, the greater the commitment. Well, we just won't argue anymore. Well, mediation, we you're often agents of reality will say, well, how are you going to do that? And and then we also back it up with what will happen. Um, you know, what can you do to prevent this from happening again? Or what will you do if it does, if this conflict comes up again? So, um, so to follow up, I would 
try to create the environment um, that you had when you were re looking at the conflict um, and resolving it. And like, we're gonna get together again. <clears throat> we're gonna sit around the kitchen table and, um, and turn off our cell phones and we're gonna look at to, and, and examine how things are going so far and see if we need to adjust that. So try to replicate the environment where, where you were actually able to maneuver through and out of that conflict and reach agreements and, um, and then use that environment to uh, evaluate and see how things are going. Uh, mediation is another process you can use to help um, in family conflicts. Again, often it's, as I've said before, it's really hard to navigate through. So in mediation, it is voluntary. It is non-adversarial. We have no coercive powers whatsoever, nor do we want them. Um, we remain neutral. Um, the question of mediation is not who's right, who's wrong. It's what's right. What's right for both of you or your family situation to get on the other side of this. It is confidential and it allows the family members to determine for themselves their own path to discern and to determine um, uh, the outcome. That's really why judges refer order people or refer people into mediation. I've heard so many uh, family court judges, juvenile court judges say, I really care about your family. I really care about your future and your children and your and you, but I can't love your children the way you do. And you too, as mother and father in the best position to make those important decisions. So go to mediation and try it. See if the mediator can help you create an environment that is um, friendly, that is purposeful, and that has dignity. Lori, thank you um, for that mediation tip there. Question, what if the situation of a family conflict never gets to the court? How does the family move to uh, someone else helping to mediate the situation? Mm -hmm. Where do they go? When sure. is it a good time to make that decision? Mm -hmm. Well, I would certainly timing wise, and you know that you know your family and yourself better than anyone um, is before it gets to a crisis level, before it gets to certainly before it gets to fisticuffs. But um, when you realize that you know this this issue is not going away, it's not getting better by itself. Um, ignoring it or um, being a shark and demanding isn't isn't helping. Um, we don't want it to get to a crisis where relationships are damaged to the point that they may not be able to be put together. So before the crisis, another way, or, or even if there's after a crisis, if, it, if there's been a big blow up and people are kind of coming down from that um, uh, in reaching an equilibrium, me mediation is not a uh, crisis intervention. It is designed before a crisis or after a crisis. Um, and you can certainly call Piedmont Dispute Resolution Center. We are a nonprofit. We're here for the community. Um, people who go through the courts and, uh, don't pay for mediation. We do charge, but we, uh, we were actually just talking about this yesterday at the center. Um, but um, we charge on a sliding scale based on income. And we, um, we are here for the community. I always tell people, don't let cost keep you away. Um, so, um, I mean, we've had people pay. I think it's important that people pay something, have some skin in the game, but um, as little as $5. Honestly, and even if they can't afford that, it's, it's okay. We're here for you. We're here for Lori, you. Um, before we um, go to closure, you, you had a very, um, important statement you made there about what mediation is and isn't um where you're talking about not in a time of crisis that statement that you just made previously would you state that again please uh, so mediation is not crisis intervention thank if you somebody it, it is not it is not at that height of crisis because it requires people to listen and it requires people to speak 
And when you're in a crisis, particularly a uh, peak of anger, you are not in a, in, or that other person, they are not in a, not in a state where they can listen or they can talk. In, in fact, it's really a time to be very selective about your words because most of what you say will either not be heard or misinterpreted. Thank you. Um, good point. A lot of uh, comment, final comment that we have here is, um, Lori, you're being thanked for being really helpful and giving some good thoughts there. Um, many thank yous. So we're going to let you sum it up as to what we can take home. And um, please, all participants, again, we thank you so much for joining us today. Um, there will be an interview process, um, not an interview, I'm sorry, a survey process that Bridget will address. And uh, we'll have a final slide here as to when our next Lunch and Learn is. And I will let Bridget address that as well. So Lori, if you'd like to sum it up and thank you again for all of your time today and the excellent information that you've shared with all of us as we go about our day-to-day -day lives, recognizing disputes and how to navigate through them. Uh, the only thing, I, I always give money back guarantees that if you try even one of these strategies or approaches and it doesn't make a difference, uh, you can have your money back. And no one's ever come back. <laughs> but um, and, but um, and that's what I would encourage is try it. Just try it. That's the hardest part, you know, changing the way you do, you do things or the way a person does things. But, but try even one of these uh, concepts, ideas, skills. And I believe that you will make a difference, um, that it will make a difference in your life in that relationship. Uh, we do have something called, I know I'm going a little over time here, but um, Piedmont Dispute Resolution has, Center has started something called the Peace Builders um, Ambassadors kind of club meeting. And once a month we get together, um, it's in person. We, um, we share some of our, what we know, our knowledge in conflict management. And then the people who are attending, we just had one last night and we talked about values, how our values impact conflict in our lives. Um, next month, it'll be, it's the second Wednesday of every month, it'll be on de-escalation, de-escalation techniques when you're in a conflict. And, um, and you're welcome. And then the people who come also talk about how we can get, how PDRC can get the word out to the wider community on strategies and conflict management, because that's what we really want. We want as many community members as possible to know about the skills and, and use them, and use them when they need them. Knowledge is power. Thank you so much, so much, Lori, for all that you shared with us today. And you will see on the screen right now um, her contact information, and a link will be sent to you for the evaluation and all of the resources that were spoken about today, including the peace builder that uh, Lori just mentioned. Thank you again. We appreciate Thank all you. of you. Thank you. Our next um, Lunch and Learn will be Thursday, February the 9th, 12 to 1 p.m. And it will be about safe, healthy relationships and boundaries with safe service to abused families. Bridget, is there anything else you'd like to share? I hope you've covered it. Thank you so much, Darlene. And thank you so much, Lori, for this excellent information and presentation. And we look forward to learning more about the Peace Builder Program. And again, I will send all this information out in an email after the session. And this will be up, posted up on YouTube for anyone that wants to go back to it. And that'll be in the email as well. Thank you all for your time today. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, Darlene. Thank you, Lori. Thank you.